a single unicycle. <laughs> I, I want to say, from the very first time I saw it, you know, he lived on uh, College Avenue, and I told him it was dangerous. But he had a long story convincing me that he would manage, and he had a helmet. And it's true, he did wear a helmet. So that's good. Uh, but anyhow, it's uh, you, you've been a real pleasure to have because you bring. Uh, really a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of life to the lab. And, uh, you know, I, I should like to mention for everybody in this uh, group that his family is here, and his father just finished defending his PhD. His father and mother both architects. Graduation, <laughs> <laughs> his uh, ceremony will be in January. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yours is next week, right? So, <laughs> thank you so much, Shankar. Right. So you know, with the aim of at least trying to be the second uh, PhD graduate in the family, I figured it would be nice to to get together with all of you and tell you uh, a little bit about the the conclusions of the the work that I've been doing over the last few years at Berkeley. Uh, it really has been a joy uh, to, to spend this time here with you. And really, the work that I'm going to describe, many of you are already very familiar with it, because this is really the, the work that uh, many of us have been you know, getting, getting out there together. So anyway, the, the focus, you know, I think I've been interested in many different uh, aspects of robotics since I got here. But I think the, the, guiding, the guiding common thread has really been to think about how can we get autonomous systems whether this means robots, drones, self-driving cars, to actively think about safety, about whether or not they're going to be able to remain safe. And to use that to be able to provide guarantees to the users and the people around these systems that there's not going to be any, any sort of you know, uh, bad underside outcome. Um, so you know, how do we go about actually getting these systems to be safe in a way that is meaningful than that, uh, that people are uh, comfortable with. So traditionally, this is how we've gone about it. Uh, robotics have been operating for quite a few decades now in uh, factories, on factory floors, and we've just kept them away from people, away from large sources of uncertainty, and by having a controlled, well-defined environment where the robot is operating, we can just do all of this safety analysis offline, so we can just have very smart engineers sit down reason about what are the conditions that the system is going to be operating on, and then making sure that do those are going to be safe. However, the current trend that we're seeing in robotics is that more and more uh, as capabilities advance, we're starting to deploy them outside of factories and out in the real world. And as this happens, the increased complexity and uncertainty of these other environments means that we can no longer do these safety analysis offline because it's not practical for engineers to be able to come up with every eventuality that the system might encounter ahead of time. So then how do we go about safety analysis online and without a ca uh, cage? Well, the um, first, uh, the, you know, the, the year before coming to Berkeley, I spent some time uh, working in industry at uh, uh, Aerialtronics, and this is how they went about it. So what you're looking at now is a drone that is, you know, effectively pretty uh, well guaranteed to stay within a certain radius of its takeoff spot on the floor. Now, the objective here was to be able to try test out a controller, making sure the drone wasn't going to fly into the neighbor's house. And while you can argue that this is sort of an okay uh, safety measure, obviously it's not the most principled one. And certainly, personally, not one that I particularly <laughs> trust. So then we got, uh, you know, I came to Berkeley, started doing some exciting research in safe learning. And so he here we were again with quad rotors, and we were trying some interesting learning controllers that were helping the robot figure out how to fly, and then suddenly it did this. <laughs> so this this is, uh, I think Claire and I both Claire feels pain feel, feel some pain every time we watch this video. This, uh, this led to uh, over a week of us having to repair the drone. It was a week of being very sad grad students. This was uh, Ken A and, and me working on the, on the project and you know, we're really trying to figure out where did we go wrong and what, did, what is it that we can do to make sure that 
you know, we can run these kinds of uh, these kinds of experiments safely without having to go back and repair, spend a week repairing the quad rotor between every two runs. Um, and so, you know, I turned to Kenny and said, "Look, don't worry, I've got this. Uh, let me go find a rope." But unfortunately, <laughs> Kenny didn't buy that. And I think it's a good thing that he did. And instead, we sat down and did some math. And so we used a dynamical model of the systems of the systems uh, evolution and our ability to control it. And we used that model to come up with some robust theoretical safety guarantees that allowed the system to fly, making sure that we would never allow it to do anything that could be potentially risky. And this worked pretty well for conditions that were roughly similar to the model, the mathematical model that we had constructed for the system. But at some point we said, okay, well, this isn't going to go out into the real world. And, you know, there's going to be things that it didn't model, like, for example, wind. And so what happens if we fly in the presence of unmodeled wind? So we turned on this big fan, and when the quad rotor flew into the airflow of the fan, we saw something happen, which was that even though it had some theoretical safety guarantees that were true, that were mathematically true for the mathematical model of its own dynamics, eventually these guarantees did not apply to the physical system because we had taken it so far away from the conditions that it was assuming. And you know, safety really at the end of the day um, is something that needs to apply to the physical system, to the real system, and or not only to the mathematical model. And uh, Ken is out there from the old And you know, this is not only a, a question of uh, you know, wind disturbances, it's just particularly important given that more and more we're starting to deploy or try to de deploy robotic systems in environments where they are interacting actively with people. So here is Sylvia, our canonical human being. And so we ran some experiments saying, can we get a quad rotor to move around a human in a way that, uh, that preserves safety in a meaningful way? And what we found was that whenever Sylvia was moving according to plan, and here according to plan means in a way that is you know, roughly understandable by the robot, then everything went fine. But whenever Sylvia deviated, as she is doing in this uh, picture here, in this video here, the quad rotor got in the way, and you know Sylvia got very upset, as you can see. <laughs> so we said, okay, well, we have to be able to do better than this. And at the end of the day, we figured out, you know, a theoretical guarantee is only as good as the model that it's based on. And eventually, it's only a matter of time before the universe figures out a way to, uh, you know, to uh, breach our models. So, how can we go about safety? Uh, acknowledging that the model that we're using might be imperfect. And mind you, this is not only a thing that happens inside of the lab, this really is a problem that we're finding in real world environments as we're trying to deploy autonomous systems. Here we have you know, uh, Uber and, uh, and Google still driving cars. Uh, they got into trouble in both of these cases by not being able to correctly <coughs> uh, model where the human was going to go, where there might be a human and what they might try to be doing. Um, so, uh, this is also something that has been very much in the, in the public eye in the, in the recent times. So here is a statement by the European Commission. Uh, this is their working guidelines on trustworthy AI. Human beings will only be able to confidently and fully reap the benefits of AI if they can trust the technology. This is the Obama White House's report on preparing for artificial intelligence. Future uh, public safety must be protected as these technologies are tested and begin to mature. And recently, the Deputy Secretary General of the Chinese Academy of Sciences stated that to truly harvest the benefits of AI, we must first ensure it's secure, controllable, and reliable deployment. So if you look at the common factor here between all of these statements, you can see that trust, safety, security, reliability are really very much um, at the center. And this is really something that I think society is going to expect us to be able to deliver on. So, what I'm going to try to convince you, about, uh, convince you of here is that deploying autonomous robotic systems out in the world requires them to reason um, not only about their safety guarantees according to the mathematical model, but about the, reliab the reliability of these guarantees um, with respect to the world. And so we're going to make an important distinction here uh, during the talk between two different concepts. On the one hand, we're going to have a guarantee, which is a proven theoretical property about a model. And this is something that is mathematically correct. On the other hand, on the other side of the gap, we're going to have an assurance. And by this, we will mean a high confidence statement that we make about a physical system, about the real system, which can typically be based on a mathematical model. But it's important to distinguish between the two because they operate on different kinds of objects. One, a mathematical abstraction. The other one, the actual real system. 
So these two components have really guided, I think they've been the, the central thread of my PhD over a few years. Uh, on the one hand, trying to work on what are the tools that we can use to do theoretical safety analysis. Um, uh, I'll tell you a bit about uh, Hamilton Jacoby safety analysis, which is really something that follows the tradition, I think, started by Shankar and Claire. Um, and uh, also how to make it scalable, so we can make it work with multiple agents when there's maybe partial information about the environment with its other agents in the environment. On the other hand, also trying to think about how we can apply these systems on real, the, the, these algorithms and these techniques on real robotic systems. In some cases, systems that are learning, in other cases, systems that have humans to interact with, or cases where uh, the systems are uncertain about what their actual physical dynamics are. Now, uh, to focus things you know, uh, a little bit, I will be talking about three of these things that I think are particularly uh, important and central to the thesis, um, which will be Hamilton Jacoby safety analysis, how do we do safety for systems that are learning as they go, and how do we keep them safe when they're operating around humans. So first, to talk about Hamilton Jacoby safety analysis, we need to place ourselves in the context of what's called optimal control. And this is really the mathematical discipline of making decisions for systems that evolve over time. So, here's going to be a little cartoon. We're going to have the system that's going to be the state of uh, the world. This going to be our robot, but also other variables in the world that the robot cares about. And we will have some notion of how the state of the world evolves over time. So here, x dot, the time derivative of x, will be a function of the state, x itself, and u. And this u represents the control input, which is our ability to affect the evolution of the system. For example, if you have a self-driving car, this could be you know, the steering wheel, the, uh, the brakes, and the accelerator. Well, depending on what choices we make with this control input, we can have different evolutions of the system. And the question that ultimately optimal control is trying to answer is, which one of these is the best one? Which one do we prefer? So we can write this as, try to maximize, find the supremum over <coughs> U, the control input, of some performance metric something that you care about that depends on the state and the input over time. Here I'm using boldface to mean uh, the evolution of a trajectory over time. Now, optimizing over these uh, trajectories uh, you know, all at once is very, is very difficult. However, there's an extremely useful technique that was introduced in the 50s and 60s, uh, which is called dynamic programming that allows us to bring some structure into solving this question through the presence of time which is something that evolves linearly and only forward. So what dynamic programming says is, say that you care about something like the sum of some uh, performances, some uh, rewards that you're going to accumulate over time, or about the average. It turns out that you can go to the end of time and just reason backwards. You can start at the end and say, how happy am I right now? What if I take one step backward in time? What is the best decision that I can make from here, given that I know how happy I will be at the different points where I can end up? And then, with how happy I am now, I can take one more step backward in time and keep repeating this process to actually solve the, uh, the ultimate decision problem for the entire length of time by simply making uh, a sequence of instantaneous decisions. So this is actually a very useful technique, and it has applications in different, uh, in different domains. Now, there's a slight problem with this whole formulation, which is, well, we don't really always know exactly what the system is going to do. Sometimes there is uncertainty. And one way in which we can capture this uncertainty is by saying, well, suppose there's something else that can affect the evolution of my system that I don't have any control over and that I don't necessarily know ahead of time. And that's what we call the disturbance. And this gives us robust optimal control, which in the worst case we can think of as a zero-sum game that is being played between our best effort controller and the worst case disturbance, in other words, the worst thing that could happen um, given what we know about the world. So this could be, you could think of this as, you know, you're playing a game against Murphy's Law. So, uh, and you can see that now we have the disturbance trying to minimize the thing that we're trying to maximize. A person who worked uh, for many years on uh, differential games of this kind was Rufus Isaacs, who worked in the Rand Corporation in the 50s, and he was interested in, interested in a very specific kind of game which is what he called games of pursuit. And in these games, what you have is nothing like the sum or the average of performance over time, but rather you have a pursuer and an evader. You have one agent who is trying to reach a certain state of the world, like catching the other agent, and one agent who is trying to prevent that from happening. And I did some really uh, fantastic uh, you know, early research in this area that really set the, the basis 
for what we now call safety analysis. Because it turns out when you're trying to prevent something back from happening, that is essentially a good definition for a safety problem. So let's look at how we do safety analysis these days, kind of keeping this cartoon of the system that evolves uh, according to the inputs that we give it. Suppose that somebody tells us, hey, here's a set of states of the world that we really don't want you to reach. And we can think of this as you know, the failure set or the forbidden set. Well, can you reason about the trajectories of your system and ensure that at no point in time will it be part of F? So for all times, the point that I'm at in the trajectory is outside of the set F. Well, depending on the control that we choose, this might be true or not. So really what we're asking about is, does there exist a, uh, a set of actions that I can take, a choice of control that will keep me outside of the forbidden set. And one way in which we can quantify this is if we think of something like a, some sort of a signed distance function, so a metric, how far away are we from violating our constraints? And so uh, if you plot the evolution of this uh, metric over time for the two trajectories that we drew, you can see that in one case it uh, never becomes negative because this distance is always positive. In the other case, it does become negative. So what we'd like to have is uh, the ability to realize that one trajectory is safe and the other one is not. If we think of the sum of distances over time, this is equivalent to having the integral here. And you can see that the integral of these two curves, the area under the curve, is really positive in both cases. So this is not really what we're looking for. Instead, if we look at the minimum, clearly the minimum is what's going to tell us that this thing dips under zero and therefore it's unsafe. So let's take a closer look at this. And this is what we call a reachability problem. Let's take a closer look at this picture and see how we can propagate the information about the minimum uh, distance that we're going to see backward in time so that we can do dynamic programming with it. So what we do is what we care about is the value is going to, uh, to capture the minimum future safety distance or safety margin that we're going to have over time. So here is what we do. We go to the very end of time and we say, how far away are we now? that's the distance, let's take one step backward in time and compare the current margin to the minimum future margin that we propagate. We basically take this value and we copy it over here. We compare these two and the smallest one is, in this case, the, uh, the current value, which means that we're closer now than, than we will be later to violating our constraints to going below zero. So we keep propagating this information backwards in time by the same rule until we get to a point where as we compare how close we're going to be later and how close we are now, we see that uh, now we are closer, sorry, uh, now we are not as close as we will be later. So we now want to keep this value over here, which means that we propagate in this particular way. And what's important here is that at every uh, step of this, uh, of this uh, process going back, we're having these two, uh, these two inputs, our best effort control and the worst case disturbance, compete about whether we approach or we stay as far as possible from violating our constraints. So once we're able to do this, um, we can reason about safety. Here is the continuous time version of this. I won't get into a lot of details here, but just so you know, this is something that we can actually do as a differential equation going backward in time in continuous time in space instead of needing to take actual steps going backward in time. So the theory for this was really laid, uh, laid down in the 80s by some uh, mathematicians who did partial differential equations and then exploited in the, in the 2000s by um, some people essentially from the, from the same academic family uh, that uh, Shankar and Claire started here at Berkeley. Um, what we were able to show a few years later is that in fact if we allow this, uh, this function to change over time, for example if we have a time varying obstacle, an obstacle that moves over time, or even if the dynamics change over time, we can still, in fact, use the same machinery to compute um, the safety of the problem without incurring any additional computational cost. And this was, in fact, a very useful result that has allowed us to do some additional safety analysis that I'll tell you about in a few minutes. All right, so let's look back here. We've been able to determine that this is a safe trajectory because the minimum over time is positive. If we did the same thing with the other trajectory, we would see that the minimum over time is negative. Therefore, this is not a safe trajectory. Okay. So let's take an actual look at how this computation works in practice. And for that, I'm going to use a beautiful animation that only Sylvia knows how to make. She <laughs> created some fantastic visualization uh, machinery uh, on the same, the same kind of code that we use to compute safety analysis. Uh, so I'm going to use that to show you how this works. So suppose that uh, the forbidden set is, in this case, this disk, 
over here. Let's sort of like look at it from the top uh, or you know with perspective and let's draw the distance to the circle as a, as a function over here so you can see that it's a cone. So the more far away we are, the higher the distance and so that's what this cone is representing. And what we do when we run this Hamilton-Jacobi safety analysis is we propagate this uh, minimum future distance backward in time by asking this point, hey, what's the closest that you're going to get to the cone, uh, sorry, to the disk later on? And so you can see how this value kind of grows outward from the cone, and what we end up with is any point that is inside here has a negative future distance, which means that in the future it will be inside of the disk. Therefore, this gives us an important notion, which is what we call the uh, safe set, the state from which the controller can keep the system from entering the, uh, the failure states no matter what the disturbance is trying to do to push it in. And this notion of the safe set is something that we're going to use uh, later on moving forward when we talk about safety uh, assurance for these systems. But let me show you something a bit you know, practical that we can, do, uh, we can do with this. So here we're going to have an actual pursuit evasion game of the type that ISAX was interested in in the 50s. And so we're going to have this little cartoon game where the players are playing inside of this uh, square room. There's the evader over here and the pursuer, which is the red triangle. And to keep things interesting, we're going to say, well, the evader is restricted to move on this uh, dashed rectangle. The pursuer will lose speed over time, which you can think of as, you know, it's, it's losing fuel as it goes, so it loses propulsion. And the obstacle is not just going to be sitting here in the middle of the room, it's actually going to go down and then move back up. And here we assume that the players actually know that this is going to happen, so they know how the obstacle is going to move. So when we give this to uh, humans and we say, hey, why don't you try to control the circle to make sure the triangle can't catch you? It turns out people are not able to do this well because basically there's two strategies. If you cross over to this side, then the triangle has plenty of time to cut the corners and catch you on this side of the game. But if you stay on this side, well, then you're a sitting duck and then the triangle can catch you easily. But it turns out that when we do the safety analysis, we get this boundary, this safety boundary that tells you that because the triangle is outside of this boundary, there is something that the circle can do to avoid getting caught by the triangle. When we play the simulation forward, with both optimal trajectories, we see what happens. And what happens is that when the circle plays optimally, what it chooses to do is to go to the center uh, top of the square and just wait here. And it lingers on for just long enough that it can then move out of the way at the very last second and move out of the way of the obstacle just as the triangle gets hit by it. And so it manages to escape. So the interesting thing here is that this is, you know, it's a non-intuitive strategy. And I think, you know, the lesson to learn from here is that Safety analysis can really reveal non-obvious strategies that our engineers might not be able to manually come up with. And doing the safety analysis can really allow our systems to be safer than anything that we can sort of like you know, hand tune or, or hand define. Now, another thing that we did, and this was in collaboration with NASA, was we said, well, can we use this kind of safety analysis to make um, uh, drones, in this case, be able to plan their paths, say, you know, we want to have uh, a thousand or ten thousand vehicles flying over San Francisco and have them plan safe paths with respect to one another in a way that is safe and tractable. It turns out that NASA had this um, first come first served uh, uh, rule that meant that if you uh, pulled the, the, their server and said hey I want a trajectory they would give you a trajectory that would respect all the already planned trajectories but then anybody who came after you would have to respect your trajectory. So this actually gives us a, a straight priority ordering that means that we could do the safety analysis treating other vehicles that already have their trajectories as moving obstacles in our space. And so by doing that, you can see how the computation goes. We have the target of every vehicle as a disk, and what we're propagating backwards is uh, the safe reachable set, which is a set of states from which we can safely reach the destination. So once this vehicle gets its computation, it goes and becomes a moving obstacle for the second vehicle, now the second vehicle becomes a moving obstacle with the first vehicle for the third vehicle and so on. And you can see how these obstacles, as they move, they cut into the propagation of the safe reachable sets for the other vehicles. And the really wonderful thing about this is that we can do this uh, computation in a way that scales linearly with the number of vehicles. So if we double the number of vehicles, we double the amount of computation. Uh, but adding one more vehicle just adds some computation. It doesn't multiply the computation you need to do by a huge number. So, so this was extremely, this was extremely uh, uh, exciting to us, and you know I showed it to you uh, for four vehicles, but here is a simulation that uh, Ken and Mo, uh, two other folks in the lab, ran for 200 vehicles 
simulate it over San Francisco with different wind conditions and different, uh, different timing schemes. But you can see how they're all basic, uh, basically planning consistent trajectories with respect to each other in a way that is guaranteed to preserve safety even with some amount of existing wind. So that's sort of the, you know, the mathematical machinery for uh, coming up with proofs of safety for these dynamical systems. But of course we're also interested in how we apply them to actual physical robotic systems that we can play with. So let's go back to this video. I'm sorry, Claire, I think it's going to play again. Uh, on the <laughs> quadcopter flying into the ceiling and then right into the ground. So this is a good example uh, because it actually gives us some very well-defined safety constraints. So, you know, we want to avoid the ceiling and we want to avoid the floor. Fire marshal just told us that, uh, you know, things like that happening, the lithium-ion mm. battery can Yes. <laughs> well, that's a whole that's a whole other kind of words. <laughs> yes. Uh, exploding batteries are definitely a, <laughs> a different story, um, but also very relevant to safety. In this case, we're going to assume that the safety of the dr the battery of the drone will not explode during flight. Uh, but there's a ceiling and there's a floor, and we want to make sure that we don't hit either of them. So here, I'm going to plot the two states that we care about in this problem, which are going to be on the vertical axis, the actual vertical position of the drone. And then I'm going to plot velocity on the uh, horizontal axis, which means that if you're here in the left side of the plot, it means you're moving down. The more to the left you are, the faster you're moving down. And on the right side of the plane, you're moving up, up with the same, the same uh, rule. So we have some you know, relatively simple dynamic model, model of the quad rotor. Basically, this is Newton's second law. It says the acceleration we get is going to be proportional to the force that we ask the propellers to give us. And we have uh, gravity pulling down. And then, you know, we have an additive disturbance that says, hey, and also there might be other things that we didn't really model with this simple double integrator um, uh, equation. So when we do the safety analysis, we get essentially this uh, shape for a set. That means that if you're inside of this region, if you're in the center of the room and not moving too fast, you're safe. But if you're too close to the ground and moving down very fast, then that is unsafe. And the same thing happens if you're close to the ceiling and moving up very fast. OK, so we get this really useful theorem that says, as long as you're inside of the safe set to begin with, you can actually allow your system to do whatever it wants while it's on the interior of the safe set, as long as you apply the safe action when you get to the boundary. Because this safe action will prevent you from crossing the boundary into the unsafe part of the state space. And so you can continue doing whatever you want, hit the boundary again, apply the safe action, and you're guaranteed to bounce right back in. So this is actually something very useful that we can use for learning systems. So we said, can we use <coughs> this machinery with a quadcopter that's going to be trying to learn how to fly a vertical trajectory efficiently? So we said, let's try some uh, you know, more or less state-of-the-art policy gradient reinforcement learning techniques. So let's have the, the, the drone learn by trial and error how to uh, fly in a way that is more efficient. But, and here's the, you know, here's the twist, we're going to set all of its initial weights in the learning algorithm to zero, which means that at the beginning, the drone has no idea how to fly efficiently. So if I just hit play, the robot, the first, time it'll try, the first thing it'll try to do will be to drop and crash into the ground. But it doesn't, and the reason that it doesn't is that we're actually applying the safety override with the, uh, with the safety analysis. So we're actually protecting this bubble where it needs to fly. And you see that after a few seconds of flying and not having very good ideas, the safety controller starts saying, hey, what if I try to fly up when I have to go up and then release the thrust when I have to go down? And you can see that this is the uh, reference trajectory that we have given it. And after less than a minute, it's actually figured out how to track that trajectory in a way that is fairly efficient. And here we're not claiming to advance the state of the art in quadcopter control, but what we're doing that is remarkable is that we figured the drone was able to learn this safety controller without ever crashing, even though it started with a really uh, poor and really unsafe initialization. But of course you might ask, okay, yeah, this worked because there was nothing weird going on and your dynamics uh, were roughly correct, but what happens if you introduce a fan? And so this brings us back to the story about the gap. We have you know, Newton's second law and we have our, our theoretically guaranteed safety envelope protection, but what happens with wind? What happens when you have a coupling between your vertical and your lateral dynamics and, and, and induced by that wind, for example? And what about other sorts of external perturbations? So here is where we can actually do a little bit better than uh, just the naive safety analysis. And so it turns out that the structure that you get in this, uh, in this safety solution allows you to do something very useful, which is you don't only have this property uh, of bouncing back in 
at the boundary of the level set, which is where your current level of safety is equal to zero. You actually have this property for any alpha greater than zero, which means that this is not the only layer of safety that you can use. You actually have a lot of concentric safety layers, all of which you can use by applying the safe action at any given point. So instead of a safety envelope, you can essentially think of having a safety onion. <laughs> and so what we proposed doing here was say, can we use data-driven analysis to, up, to update in real time our belief that each of the levels of, you know, each of the layers of the onion is something that we can rely on for safety. And then can we use that to inform the behavior of the system and tell it how conservative it needs to be about safety. The way in which we chose to quantify our uncertainty about the model error in this case was by using a Gaussian process. So a Gaussian process without getting into the full details is a way that, uh, to reason in a Bayesian framework about probability distributions over functions. Here our function was the disturbance. We wanted to know how the disturbance would vary in different parts of the state space. The disturbance here was really our model error. So it's something like there is a fan in the room and nobody told us. So what we do is we take some observations of the state and how the state evolves. Uh, and you know we infer what the local disturbance is as essentially the discrepancy between what our model expected and what we actually measured. So by doing this, we can reason about the probability of the disturbance lying uh, in, different, uh, in different value ranges. And so what happens here is after observing some amount of data, you construct what we are going to call here the prior. Uh, this is before you start flying. You've been doing some pre previous flights. And then you say, well, this is what I believe uh, the disturbance is going to be like. And now here is the set uh, of, say, the 95% confidence interval, or the 99%. This really depends on how safe, how confident you need to be in safety. And now you say, well, I'm going to use this thing as the worst case set for my disturbance. I'm going to say, expect anything within this set, and give me a safety analysis based on that. But then once you start flying, and then you start getting new information, for example, somebody turns on a fan that you have never seen before, you're going to get new observations that will lead you to have a posterior probability distribution. And when that happens, some of the initial probability mass that you had inside of this box might shift out of the box. And what we say is, hey, if you can keep track of how this total probability max inside of the box that you were using for your safety analysis is, then you can actually reason about this probability as how confident you are that your safety analysis is in fact valid. And so essentially this is what we're doing here online. We've done some amount, some initial flights, and we have some initial safety um, uh, model that we're using to do the safety analysis. And now we turn on the drone, that was uh, Kenny, Turning, uh, sorry, we turn on the, the fan, and as the system comes down, trying to track its trajectory, as before, two different things can happen, and you'll see the two of them now unfolding in the video. If we keep doing the naive analysis and we don't update our understanding of safety, then you get this ghosted video, which is essentially the one that I showed you at the beginning. The drone keeps trusting its safety analysis, even though it is now no longer accurate, and it eventually crashes into the ground. Instead, if we're doing the safety analysis, you see that the behavior is very different, and you can see it plotted over here. As soon as we start measuring things that don't make sense for us, we lose confidence in our safety analysis being correct. And the drone decides, I'm not going to go down here because I don't know what's going to happen down here. Instead, I'm going to apply my safe action now and prevent getting into a state from which maybe my safe action will no longer be a safe action after all. So that was the, uh, the learning, learning uh, part of the story. Um, but of course, humans are a very special, uh, a very special kind of, you know, uh, part of the world, and you could argue that we could treat them as disturbances. But really, there is so much structure that we can exploit in in how humans are going to interact with the system that it, you know it seems like we we really should be using this. So how can we, you know, bring humans into the safety into the safety question and actually have them collaborate with our system in preserving safety? There are, I think, two very important uh, examples of you know humans in the loop gone gone you know uh, awry or or actually saving the day, and both of these example ha uh, examples happened in happened in 2009. The first one was the miracle of the on the Hudson that some of you might have heard about. There's also a movie uh, about it now uh, called Sully with Tom Hanks. Um, and yes, yes, and he. Uh, so what happened here was the plane took off. Uh, both of the engines got taken down by bird strikes just a few seconds after takeoff, and the pilot, the human pilot, made the judgment call that the only way to land the plane safety, uh, safely was to head for the Hudson River and land it there. And thanks to that particular 
human decision that no automated system at the time would have been able to make, everybody on board was saved. On the other hand, the very same year, there was a crash uh, that was also quite, quite famous of Air France 447 flying from Brazil to France. And what happened was once, you know, once they recovered the black boxes uh, sometime later, it was determined that the failure, the original failure was a relatively non-safety critical um, loss of the, of the speed uh, signal because the speed sensors had become frozen because of, the, because of the weather. And in normal circumstances, the pilots could have just like, taken over the control and flown the, the plane safety, uh, safely to Paris. Unfortunately, the way in which the uh, autopilot disengaged and returned control to the pilots was confusing to the pilots. The pilots weren't sure what was happening. They didn't have a, you know, a full situational awareness, and they ended up making a sequence of decisions that unfortunately led the airplane to stall and eventually crash into the Atlantic. Um, and of course, more recently, for those of you who are watching the news, there's been the case of the Boeing 737 MAX, which is really an extremely uh, unfortunate example of how an actual safety-oriented automation system, if not properly designed, and if the interaction with humans is not properly understood, can lead to a loss of safety. Uh, and this is something that has happened twice, and I think you know, um, Boeing is right now dealing with, with the consequences of this. Um, we won't be able to talk too much about this. There's, um, uh, you know, there's a different talk that some of you uh, might have seen where we delve into the details of this. But in any case, going back to our uh, scene of you know, the human interacting with the robot, how can we have the robot try to at least understand how much it can trust its current model of the human? It turns out that there's, you know, there's some work that has been done on how robots can reason probabilistically about what humans might be up to. And so, um, these are mathematical models that were originally introduced by mathematical psychology and by econometrics, and they've become very popular in the last few years in also the robotics literature. And a particularly common one is what we call a Boltzmann rationality model. And what this model does is it says, well, it's not reasonable for the robot to assume that it knows exactly what the human is going to do, but it can reason about what actions are more or less likely. And in particular, if it has some notion of the human's utility function, of what the human likes or dislikes or what a human might be trying to do, then it can say, well, the probability of the human taking an efficient action is going to be more likely than the human taking an inefficient action. And in particular, for the Boltzmann model, we say it's exponentially more likely. Given the Q function, which is, you can think of it as symmetric of the utility of a certain action, right now, given what the human will be able to do in the future. <coughs> so here we parameterize all of this by a parameter, by a parameter of theta that represents what the human might be trying to do. And so, for example, say that the robot believes that the human might be trying to leave the room. Then conditioned on that, the human might have a probability of trajectories that look something like this, where pink trajectories have high probability and green uh, trajectories have lower probability. So this is all and well as long as the human is actually doing something along these lines. Unfortunately, something, sometimes humans don't follow our models. Uh, if a bee flies into the room, the human turns around and suddenly the robot gets in trouble. So the question here is, well, is there something more that we should be doing and that we weren't really doing just by reasoning probabilistically? And I would argue, yes, having a probabilistic model doesn't mean that now you're, you know, you've done all your homework. Your probabilistic model also needs to reason about, well, what is actually happening in the world? Is this the right probabilistic model to be using? So experiments with bees are difficult in the lab, so instead we spill some coffee. And also we didn't really spill some coffee, but here's a, uh, an imaginary coffee spill, which is actually what led Sylvia to deviate in that video that I showed you earlier. And because the robot doesn't know about the coffee spill, you can see that it gets in the way and ends up crashing into her. And if you, I'll play the video again. If you look at the predictions that the robot is making from the bird's eye view, you'll see that even though Sylvia is deviating, the robot is just expecting her to kind of like veer back and start walking straight into, straight towards the goal, which is not what she's doing. So you might ask, well, is there something that the robot could have been doing as Sylvia was deviating to realize that its model wasn't really working so well? And of course, you can say here, well, I mean, there could have been some sort of like last, last resort. Um, you know, physics-based avoidance maneuver that the drone could have followed. And this is true, technically, you could have, you know, avoided Sylvia at the very last second, but even if you put that in place, you don't really want to have drones doing emergency maneuvers all of the time, when in fact they can simply do things, they can reason about their ability to stay safe without extreme maneuvers um, ahead of time and reason about how much they should trust their models. So the conclusion that we got to here was really, look, if the human is not following the model, it's probably not the human's fault. You shouldn't be too hard on the human. <laughs> Instead, you really want to reconsider uh, how you know how much you're trusting your model. So again, going back to the, uh, the the thing that struck me about that movie, Sully, 
was no. right after the, the when he went to the National Transportation Safety right. Board. Now the key thing was everybody wanted to declare it as pilot error. Mm -hmm. And That's right. everybody wanted to show that it could be landed in Teterboro or right. LaGuardia and that yeah. we screwed up. And so I, I think it's a really yeah. Too too easy to rush judgment. Right, exactly. And I think what, what ended up happening in, in, in this whole uh, investigation is that they were really using an inappropriate human model. They were expecting that uh, as soon as the, the birds struck the engines, uh, the pilot could have gone like, okay, LaGuardia, immediately. And then, you know, like, <laughs> saying, okay, what happened? Do we still have the engines on? What, what are the options that we should be considering? And, you know, that takes a few seconds. So using, again, the most accurate possible model of how the human is actually operating is something that will allow you to make better judgments. So anyway, so here we have you know the goal-driven human behavior as part of the model. Uh, we were talking about this utility function, and we have you know this notion of the human is being noisily rational, which means actions will be more likely when they're directed towards the goal that we have in our model. But this is not always true. And why isn't it always true? Well, you know, bees, coffee spills, any sort of unmodeled things that the human might be trying to do. Andrea has some really scary videos of people crossing the street and then doing all sorts of unexpected things from running after a, a ball to getting into a fight uh, or just like running back as they drop their cell phone. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that can get people um, to not follow your model. So really what you're left with is, is there something that we can do to adjust our model confidence as we go? And it turns out that many of these models have certain parameters that allow you to regulate your entropy, essentially. How much, you know, how much you're concentrating your probability mass around what your model is predicting to be the likeliest thing. In particular, in the Boltzmann model, we have what's called, often called the rationality coefficient, which we think is a little bit of an unfair name, because it's not really that the human is being irrational, it's typically that your model is not really getting the right thing. Um, so, you know, in any case, it's uh, often called the inverse temperature parameter in, uh, in physics, uh, which is what this model is inspired by. And what we said is, instead of keeping this as a fixed parameter that, you know, gets uh, established by some engineer before you even deploy the system, why don't we actually reason about it as a hidden state? Why don't we keep track of how much, how much are humans' actions actually concentrating around the optimal actions predicted by our model? And so, the hope is that when the human starts running away from the bee, then the robot will say, well, that's a pretty unlikely thing for you to do if you were actually moving towards the door. So now I'm going to start thinking that maybe, and here's the Bayesian update, maybe it's more likely that you have a lower value of, uh, of this uh, rationality coefficient or this model confidence uh, given the thing that you just did. And so this allows the robot to say, you know, maybe I should be making predictions that look a little bit more like this, which means I don't really know what you're going to do next because so far you haven't been following my model very well. So, another question you might ask is, well, how do you be doing safety analysis uh, with, you know, with uh, bounce on how far away your physical model is from the, from, uh, from the actual physical system? Can we combine this sort of worst case tracking error bounds or worst case analysis that you did with your disturbance with these now probabilities of where the human is going to go? And there are some natural ways of doing this, and some of, you know, one of these we have explored, which is, so that you've been observing the human for a while, and then you have this uh, uh, plan of what you would like to do, and here is where you believe the human is likely or unlikely to be in the future. So this is your probability distribution of the human. Well, if you do the safety analysis, uh, in this case it's a slightly different uh, flavor of the safety game, where you say, well, I want to stay as close as possible from my ideal, uh, from the ideal location that I'm planning to get to, but I know that my physical system might not be exactly in the same place then if you can do this worst case analysis to figure out, well, where are the places where you might physically be as you're trying to follow this trajectory, we can project all of those possible locations onto the space of where the human is going to be and essentially integrate this uh, probability mass. How much intersection do I have between where I might be and where the human is likely to be? And that probability mass is essentially giving you the probability of crash assuming that you know, your robot could be anywhere inside of this, inside of this map. So um, let me show you very quickly how this looks. This is, uh, these are actual human trajectories that I'm going to show you now. I believe they're actually Claire walking around in the room. She's a fantastic human subject. She behaves, she behaves very in a rational. very, very in a rational and clean way. Um, but let's see what happens if we fix the model confidence. So here, Claire starts to move uh, around towards one of uh, these red goals that the robot knows about in the model. And you can see that it's making fairly confident predictions about where she's going to go. 
she starts moving towards the second goal and the predictions are fairly confident. But now she's going to start moving to a third location that the robot doesn't know about. And look at the confidence in the predictions. The predictions are still very confident. The robot is very confident that Claire is going to turn around and start going towards this goal, which is obviously not what she's doing. And as a result of that, it gets into an unsafe configuration with Claire. The robot was simulated, so Claire is fine. Um, <laughs> but now let's play exactly the same trajectory of Claire with a different um, simulated robot that is actually maintaining this Bayesian belief about how confident it should be. It's very similar at the beginning, but as soon as Claire, as Claire starts moving away from any model goals, it says, wait a second, what, it, what is going on? I have no idea. And you can see that the predictions become much more cloudy, so to speak, and then the robot plans a safe trajectory that is being more conservative, saying, I'm not going to get too close, because I'm not sure where you're going to go. So we made some videos of this working, but our videos weren't as, as good. But we also invited uh, Wired to come and, uh, and cover our work, and they made so much more beautiful videos. You can see them here. It's just, it's, it's just fantastic. So anyway, here is <laughs> And so what you can see here is that she's starting to deviate away from the coffee spill, just uh, as Sylvia was doing before. And as soon as this happens, you can already see the robot being like, oops, I'm going to get out of the way. So you can see it tilting away. And so, indeed, it gets out of the way. <laughs> it doesn't even have to worry about that. The robot. You see, she's not having a, a really good time. So, so yeah, she's um, It's like three hours in. You know, so here, here's, a, here's a slow mo version as well. Uh, so you can see how really, how effectively it gets out of the way as soon as she starts doing something that doesn't seem to make sense. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm actually skipping some of the uh, some of the videos where the drone did crash into Andrea when it wasn't uh, doing this adaptation. Um, and even though we did crash drones into Andrea quite a, quite a bit, she has been uh, kind enough to lend me some of her slides uh, for this part, uh, which are some really pretty slides that I want to show you because it turns out there's actually a connection between this uh, notion of the the blurry prediction that you're making of where the human might go and the reachable set, the set of possible places where the human could go, which you can get with hamilton jacobi reachability analysis. And that is essentially that the support of the distribution, all the places that have non-zero mass, are exact probability mass, are exactly the places that are inside of the human's reachable set, the places where the uh, human could physically go if she decided to do that. So the difference here really is that, you know, if you look at points that have sufficiently high probability, then you have something that is, you know, a small subset of the, of the reachable set. But as you start lowering the probability threshold and you start accepting points that have even a tiny probability, then you effectively tend asymptotically towards the full reachable set. But this is not very useful. It, using the full reachable set is not a very useful thing to do because if you're thinking of all the places that a human might be or the, all the things that a human might do in a long time horizon, well, as you grow your time horizon, then you know after two steps, it's going to be a very large disk. After three steps, it's going to be a very large space, and before you know it, you're just going to conclude that there's nothing you can do to stay safe. So instead, what we're trying to say is, well, yeah, but the human is not equally likely to go everywhere. If you, we have some model where the human might go, then the probability might look something more like this, which is basically saying, well, sure, the human might still go everywhere, but like most of my probability mass is in this region. And if I'm not so confident, then I have something in between. So this is really, you can think of this as a generalization of using the forward reachable set. And these are beautiful images, thank you. Let me see these for the for the talk. So anyway, so these are these are uh, hopefully things that have given you a bit of, of the flavor of the you know the kind of, of questions that we've been trying to answer in the past few in the past few years. Um, this is you know really the the road that I've you know set for myself to to walk thus far. But I think it's probably time to turn our attention. What things are next? So, okay, one thing that we that we started hinting but didn't really get into the details of is what what's the deal with this human and robot who are thinking about each other, right? And in, in, in what we were doing, we had a robot that was thinking about how much it trusted the human and where the human might go. But really, in in practice, what's really going to happen is the human will also be actively thinking about the robot. The human will be reacting to what the robot does. So here's a human thinking about the robot. But if this is true, 
then the robot doesn't need to be think doesn't have to be thinking about just a human, but rather about a human who is thinking about the robot. And of course, the human is going to be doing exactly the same thing about the robot. And you probably see where this is going, which is if we try to do this thing, now we need to have a robot who thinks about a human who's thinking about what the robot thinks that the human thinks the robot's thinking, and then before we know it, we've completely blown things up, and things have become very intractable very quickly. So instead of doing that, we can try to resort to game theory, which allows us to reason about equilibrium. What are, what are configurations where what the robot is trying to do, what the human is trying to do, are things that are stable, that make sense with respect to each other. And this kind of analysis is something that we've uh, started using, and so here's some work that we've uh, done uh, primarily with, with Anka, also collaborating uh, also with Shankar and some students who are here. Ellie is the person who actually made all the videos that I'm going to show you that are really cool. So what I'm plotting here is, this is, you know, the two, here we're going to have the autonomous car in yellow and the human car in white. And what I'm plotting here is the value that the robot car, the, the autonomous car in yellow, predicts that it's going to have as it moves around the human. So this value is actually computed from doing a similar kind of Hamilton Jacobi style computation backward in time, but where now we're reasoning about how the agents can influence each other and how they're strategically trying to influence each other in the future. So the robot wants to do an overtaking, and you can tell before I even start the video that it has a certain incentive in blue to come behind the human. And the reason is that in some cases, that might be enough to incentivize the human to do a lane change, as you'll see on the right. If the human does a lane change, the robot just goes straight. If the human doesn't do the lane change, then you see this gradient of blue value pulling the robot car into the maneuver to overtake the human. And this is really coming out of this analysis that, that accounts for the entire um, interaction. But you know, this is not the most challenging scenario that you could this come is up a with. European overtaking in America. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can think of it that way. Say, the Italians, the Germans, you know, <laughs> don't go to the Europeans. <laughs> well, Such you know, thing does not exist. It's, it's certainly a, a choice of a choice of style. Um, but you know, driving really is a game theoretic setting. You know, it's it, it, driving on the road is really. A, it really requires you to solve, you know, game theoretic kind of interactions with other drivers on the road. And a typical example that I'm sure many of you are familiar with is you're driving on the road, you're about to overtake a truck, and then just as you're approaching the truck, you see out of the corner of your eye that somebody has shifted to the right lane, is accelerating past you, and is going to try and cut in just before you get to the truck, because they really need to go first. And this way you really feel the kind of, you know, the game theory calling and saying, what do I do? Do I, do I, you know, release the accelerator pedal, even tap the brakes, and let them merge in front of me, at least, so that they can do it safely? Or do I step on the gas and just say, no, you don't, better luck next time? So, but, you know, this is, really, this is really a choice that you can make, and when you're doing this, you're thinking about how your actions are going to change the options of the other player, and how they're going to change the decisions that they make, and how those decisions will now affect your safety, or how are you going to get to work? So. Turns okay, out that you can that. actually run this. Oh, I'm sorry. You didn't say the part how this actually happened to us on the way to town. Oh yes, it's true. It's true. It's true. I should. I should say. Okay, ignore the video. I can't go back. <laughs> okay. So this actually, this actually happened to us. We went on a on a retreat uh, with Anka to Lake Tahoe, and on the way back, we were driving right behind Anka's car, and then somebody like rushed past us and past Anka's car and just cut in front of them at the very last second, and we're like, damn it, that is. We need to write that down in math. And so that's kind of what, <laughs> what got us into this. So it turns out that we can use this kind of analysis. And so here, the white car is the one who's making the decision, do I brake or do I accelerate? In this case, it slows down. In this case, it accelerates. And you can see how when it accelerates, it gets the yellow car to abort the maneuver. And go back, let me play the two for you again. In this case, you know, there's not necessarily uh, a robot and a, and a human. It's just the two cars. In this case, we wanted the white car to be the one making the call. And you can see how here the yellow car is supporting the maneuver because this guy is accelerating. And it turns out that the thing that determines which of these of these two come out, uh, in our case, seems to be you know the initial conditions. Is the other car already going really fast and already close to me? Is it you know do I is it safer for me to accelerate and cut them off, or to slow that down and let them pass? So you know safety analysis is exciting, uh, but I also have to tell you that unfortunately it's not free. And in many cases, it doesn't really scale very well. 
Um, and so this is, I think, something that many of us, uh, in particular in Claire's lab, have been you know, dealing with. Um, and so essentially what happens is that the computation that you need to do if you want to do safety analysis just blows up exponentially with the dimensionality of your system. If you think about it, you're kind of like trying to check an entire safety surface for holes. And the more dimensions you have, the, the bigger the surface is and the more places where there might be a hole. So, you know, there's something you can do in a, in a millisecond, there's something you can do in a second, uh, a couple of, a few hours, maybe a few days, and this is actually something in the order of a few years, so you know, it's probably not within the scope of a single PhD. Mm -hmm. Yes? What are those shapes? Oh yeah, no answer. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so this is a line, uh, this is a line segment, this is a square, that's a cube, this is an attempt of a hypercube in four dimension, in four dimensions, a tesseract, and this is just like a very scary red grid. <laughs> that high dimensions are, are dangerous. Okay, so I don't think that all hope is lost, and I think this is, in fact, a very exciting direction to pursue. And one thing that uh, that you know some of us have been thinking about recently is, well, if you look at you know where the excitement in reinforcement learning is is coming from, it really seems to be because there's all of these new you know AI techniques that seem to be doing very well at solving complex problems with many different moving parts, different state variables, um, multiple players, and long horizons. And they're doing pretty well by essentially doing trial and error and getting surely suboptimal but still fairly competent solutions for these high dimensional problems. Here is, I think, a 25 dimensional uh, simulated humanoid that DeepMind was able to get to run you know, in a pretty inelegant but still pretty efficient and robust way to move up different kinds of terrains, uh, to jump over um, uh, you know, um, uh, cliffs and things like that. Unfortunately, what this is not very good at is safety. And the reason is that reinforcement learning is traditionally um, has been defined to optimize your average performance over time. Because it comes from this notion of the utilities have the form of additive rewards over time. But in safety analysis, often what we care about is what is the worst case, what is the, the worst moment that you're going to experience through the deployment of your system, and can you try to make that worst case better? Can you try to prevent bad things from happening in the worst case? So what we wanted to, to investigate was can we use a reinforcement learning machinery to, to solve or approximately compute uh, good solutions for safety controllers that we can then turn into actual guarantees with soundness properties, which means that if I say that I found a safe solution from this state, this really is a safe solution. And so this is something that we've started to look into uh, in, the, you know, in, in some recent work that is actually coming out at ICRA next week. Unfortunately, um, uh, Claire and, and I won't be there presenting the work because uh, we'll be here um, with, for the graduation ceremony. And you know, Shankar and Ankar are also uh, getting grounded, so I really appreciate you staying behind. Anyway, very quickly, the key thing that we need to do in order to be able to use the reinforcement learning machinery here is we need to be able to reason, uh, uh, to get a contraction mapping, which means we need to be able to recover from initial estimation mistakes that we made for our value function. And the way we do this is by saying, well, uh, in traditional reinforcement learning, you have a notion of a contraction mapping. And so we'd like to have a contraction, uh, sorry, of a discount factor, and we'd like to have a discount factor too. And so the way we discount the minimum is by saying, well, really when you're do using a discount factor in reinforcement learning, what you're saying is there's a small probability, one minus gamma, where gamma is a, a number between zero and one, but typically very close to one. There's a small probability that the episode will end here, that nothing interesting will happen after the current step. So the closest we're ever gonna be to violating the constraints is just how close we are right now. On the other hand, with probability gamma, things will continue rolling up forward, and so then we have the original equation. Uh, with almost full probability, but not quite full probability. And what this means is in practice, when you propagate this backwards in time, you're always contracting this uh, estimated value, this propagated value, towards your current value at every point in time. And we still have the nice property that as we take this gamma to one, asymptotically, we recover the original full solution to our safety analysis. The difference though is that now we have a contraction mapping that means that uh, we have a, you know, we have the property that two estimates of the value function will get closer and closer to each other as we continue applying the dynamic programming equation, and this has an important implication, which is um, Q learning will converge in the ways in which it usually does for traditional reinforcement learning, and this means that we can start doing things like training a neural network, as we're doing here, for the vertical quadcopter dynamics, 
And as you can see, over time, as we do more and more updates to the, to the neural network by simulating different episodes, what happens is we ultimately recover the original shape of the safe set that we know we have. And you know, we can actually do this for higher dimensional systems as well. So here's a lunar lander, which is a 6D system for which we just cannot do this with a traditional PDE solver on a grid. And still, this system was able to get fairly good results uh, and reliable results when it wants to maintain safety. We can know that a certain policy will, will give us a safety guarantee. Um, so, you know, very quickly, let me show you uh, uh, some evidence of this. For uh, this is 100 different neural networks that we trained, uh, as opposed to many papers that do like two or three and then they think they're done. Uh, and we see that very consistently for the double integrator, the carpool system, and the lunar lander, as we train the system over time, the number of safety violations that we get uh, as we sample uniformly uh, initial conditions over the state space drops, and it seems to be converging to, or at least approaching, the fraction of true states that we know are unsafe anyway. So essentially, these are the states from which it is physically impossible to uh, prevent a violation of safety. And so this is really interesting because it really seems to be getting us somewhere. For the lunar lander, it also seems to be converging, but we actually don't know what the grand truth is because we just cannot compute it. So this seems like a very, a very useful uh, set of tools. Um, also, the fractions that I'm showing here are over uh, 1,000 initial states. And as I said, we ran, we ran for 100 networks. Um, so yes, this is what I said in words. <laughs> OK, very good. Can we do this for even high dimensional systems? It seems like we can, and so I want to finish uh, this part showing you uh, some very exciting policy gradient uh, results that we got for an 18-dimensional system, which is just, I think, you know, if you told me about this three or four years ago, I would have said, nah, no way, we can't even try. So this is very exciting. Um, so here the safety condition was to say, well, okay, your hands and your elbows of this kind of like dog-like creature called the cheetah uh, shouldn't be touching the ground at any point in time. So if we train a traditional reinforcement learning system where what we care about, sorry, where what we care about is you know how far away we are on average, or where we're trying to say, well, I'm just going to give you a penalty whenever you're touching, and no penalty otherwise. Um, doing uh, you know a standard policy gradient approach just gets it to jump around and really not behave in a particularly safe way. Instead, this is what happens with our discounted safety equation using uh, good old policy gradient reinforcement learning. But we can actually do a little bit better by combining policy optimization with value learning and using something that's called soft actor critic. And here, you can see that with our formulation, the cheetah actually learns to stand in a pretty robust and reliable way. And uh, if we use a random policy, here it's basically you know, randomizing the actions, you can see that these policies are pretty robust. It's just like it's standing and sitting, but it's, it's never falling you know, flat on its, on its face or on its hands. So we think this is, you know, again, a very exciting direction to be pursuing and something that can really help this we think can ge really generalize to using kind of you know, AI and reinforcement learning in a way that encompasses safety in a way that, it, that is natural um, in its formulation. So these are this is a bit of the summary slide of the things that you know we've that I've done during my thesis some of which are you know very preliminary work sort of looking forward on what things can be. It really has been a huge team effort. I think the reason I've, I've been lucky to be able to work on so many different projects is I've had you know, some really fantastic collaborators, uh, many of whom are here, uh, and, and you know, this has really been exciting. And I think that if we continue down this road, it can really lead us to a future, uh, and this is a picture that I made a while ago, a future in which you will really trust you know, autonomous <coughs> systems and robots so much that you, it will just not be an issue for you to just let your kids go out and play with them. Uh, and you know you won't even have uh, to worry about anything. But you know, in order for us to be able to get from here to there, we first need to make sure to mind the gap. And now, if uh, you'll bear with me for a couple more minutes, I really uh, want to spend some time talking about the important stuff, which is this is really not my work. It's the work of many, many people who who have been contributing to to all of these ideas. And I think, you know, most importantly, I want, I want to talk about, um, first, my three fantastic advisors, Shankar, Claire, and Anka. Thank you all so much for your continued support and, and guidance and encouragement, and for really being role models and inspiration, and, you know, also in times of doubt, when it's unclear, you know, what the right path is, it's really fantastic to be able to, 
to have you to you know to support myself on. Um, I also uh, think there's a couple of people uh, who uh, I should mention specifically who are Rujana and Tom, uh, who are not a were not able to make it. Uh, but Rujana has been you know really uh, she always says that she's the grandma to everyone in the in the group. I you know I think I think in a way this this is true and she's such you know such a great source of um, of direction when you're not sure what is the thing that you should be doing. She's a wonderful person to talk to to ask hey, about you know, what are the what are the important what are the important things. Um, and Tom really has has been fundamental in you know kind of like taking me by the hand and, and helping me explore this very uh, scary world of how do we model humans? Uh, can we even use mathematics or or any sort of like quantitative model to think about what people are going to do or not? And you know this was very extremely you know extremely crucial to me in my in my early years um, and then you know this this all that this all the work that we've had to do and uh, you know as Sylvia said I think she put it very well you <laughs> just have to spend all day debugging because your ability is actually a few millions or billions <laughs> this, is something wrong. this is uh three of us uh Sylvia's on the other side of the camera uh working on a submission at I think about four in the morning but you know it not all has been uh you know working hard and I think a huge part of getting through the PhD and surviving has to do with the great people that you get to have around around you. This is, um, you know, among other people, this is really my, my core cohort of uh, 2013 uh, first year students in, uh, you know, in the linear systems prelim. This is the first trip that we took uh, during the first summer just before starting to, to, uh, pre to prepare for the prelim. It really has been fantastic. Some of them, you know, have already gone on to different different parts, um, d different different positions. Rule is working on AI and society at uh, NYU. Kathy is starting at MIT in a few months, uh, and Eric will be joining Waymo. Jason just had his uh, dissertation talk uh, a few days ago, um, and you know, it's it's really exciting. I think that in in our own different ways, all of us have really ended up embracing autonomous systems, <laughs> which, is, which is very important. <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, I, you know, I think it, it, it would take an entire uh, extra hour to say thanks to everyone, but I do want to uh, mention the three fantastic labs that I'd be lucky to be a part of. The Hybrid Systems Lab, uh, which just recently got a fantastic new photo shoot. Uh, the uh, Interact Lab, uh, with some really fantastic people uh, interested in all sorts of ways in which automation and humans can can work with each other. Um, and uh, Shakir's <laughs> lab. <laughs> we just don't take enough selfies. I think we should be taking more selfies in it. Uh, but it, it really has been, it really has been uh, you know, a joy to, to be part of, of, of these three fantastic groups of people, which, by the way, are also very much connected. This is, this is a, big, a big family from those of you who are not, who are not here. Um, and okay, there's a couple of dream teams that I think I really need to, to mention because they really have shaped uh, the direction that I followed in my PhD and uh, <clears throat> kind of my, my own personal growth. The first was the very first research project that I was involved in, which was a safe learning project. And well, as you've seen, it has been a very core part of, of my thinking in research. Uh, Kenny, who's standing out there, came up to me <laughs> one day when we were sitting in uh, the in Peter's, uh, Peter Abiel's advanced robotics class. Said, hey, hi, man. How's it going? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Kenny. I'm in Claire's lab. Would you like to work on a class project together? I said, like, yeah, that sounds great. What do you have in mind? He told me, well, there's this thing that we've been talking about called safe learning. I said, <laughs> uh, and so you know, that's how we got started. Uh, Melanie is now a professor at ETH. Shahab works at Apple, and he can't tell you what he does. <laughs> uh, and Jeremy is working at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, making sure that you know that technology is used in responsible. Um, and I think you know the other dream team, very much at the other extreme, at the, you know towards the end of my PhD, has been Andrea, Sylvia, and David, who is not here right now. Uh, you know, working together, getting drones to fly. You know, working, coding up, coding up uh, algorithms in this very room with a projector until late hours. Uh, getting drones to fly, getting getting you know thinking about how robots and humans are going to interact. It's been so much fun. Uh, and, and it really has been a, a joy to work together. And of course, there's uh, an additional um, 
initial uh, collaborator that I'm missing here, and that's our favorite subject, <laughs> Abby. <laughs> Actually behaves more rationally than some humans, which is interesting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, and lastly, I want to I want to point out um, one of the one of the exciting things that I've been able to do has been to kind of like step out of the, the boundaries of the department. And so Jess, who was a student in the psychology department, uh, and, and Chang, who was in mechanical engineering and just graduated last year, and Vale, who is a neuroscience, and she's probably going to graduate before we know it, uh, but in the near, in the not so far future, uh, they've really uh, also formed a really exciting and interdisciplinary team with which to think about how do we get people and robots to, to collaborate, to reason about each other, what are the right ways to formalize this problem. Um, and you know, very briefly, I want to say there's a group at Berkeley called the Center for Human Compatible AI that has also been very inspiring in in getting me to think about um, what are you know what are the long-term implications of building smarter and smarter systems and then deploying them in society. What is the interaction between these systems and society going to be like, and how do we make sure that it's uh, a safe one? So anyway, in the next 30 seconds, we did some fun things. So these are some of the fantastic uh, trips and retreats that we've gone to. This one is in Australia, as you can tell. <laughs> this was what we referred to as the Euro trip. This was the summer of 2015. We went to the European Control Conference. And then we got some fantastic, uh, very cheap flights in Europe. This is uh, Kenny and me in Menorca. Uh, this is in Austria. This is in the UK. It was, it was really fantastic. This was you know, technically a leg of the flight, but you know, we might as well go and see Oxford and, and do the Go Bears thing. So it was. Uh, it really has been a lot of fun. I want to say some of the people who are no longer here because they've moved on to to uh, you know become professors or or highly valued professionals have also been you know extremely extremely important. In, I think guiding guiding many of us. Uh, you know Roy and Katie and, uh, and Sam and Lily and Mo uh, who are not here, but I think they're very and Dorsa who are not here, but I think they're very much in. in in, in many of our memories. Um, and Aaron, who is uh, still in the Bay Area. And Dan. Uh, anyway, we did some really fun stuff. I just wanted to show you that I once did this thing, which is very unsafe. Um, although I guess I, I had like a nice uh, horse, so it was fine. Um, and uh, yes, this is, the, this is the Spanish gang, who many of whom are here. And I wanted to have a shout out for them. We have had some fantastic times together, a lot of different trips. Um, one time we told Batman to. Um, and also, we've had so much food that we've really, been you know, um, <laughs> enjoying while being here. And I want to say the the salsa scene in Berkeley is fantastic, and it's something that I've been very lucky to enjoy. And this here is my sister Carmen, who was in Berkeley for a year, and she's really been uh, a really a really important important companion throughout my life. And. Uh, and also, you know, during the PhD, during the hard times, knowing that I could just give her a call at any time uh, and tell her about how stressed out I was, it was it's something that really helped. As being a companion, I have a new one, not so new, but uh, really <laughs> one, very excited about. This has, she really has been an incredibly important source of support, especially in the last year with the whole, uh, what am I going to do with my life? Okay, let's do faculty <laughs> applications and see what happens. Um, she's really, you know, she's. Um, really part of my own safety analysis. Here she is, even trying on my cap to make sure that it fits well. <laughs> um, um, and you know, in the end, I, I want to leave the, 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 final, the final shout out, and I think this is very important to the people who are ultimately responsible to me being here in the first place, and those are my parents and my family. I think through my coming here, we've had a lot of airport reunions. Uh, and you know, it really is, it really is, a, an interesting change of, of lifestyle. I think, I think you know, in order for for us to be to be getting our PhDs at the best, best possible places, uh, they sometimes have to you know stay at home and uh, not have us around. Uh, but still, they without a moment's hesitation, they have encouraged uh, both uh, me and Carmen to go out into the world and go to the best possible place. So, for that, I am eternally grateful. So, thank you all.